Good morning, everyone. I acknowledge that we are meeting and talking today on the lands of the Kulin Nation. I recognise their continuing connection to the land and waters and thank them for protecting and being stewards of this country and its ecosystem since time immemorial. Their sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm really excited to introduce Kimmy Lovegrove this morning, a Naranjeri woman, comedian, entrepreneur and businesswoman in relation to the Kungari entertainment. Thanks, Kimmy. Thank you. Um, today was the day Nancy would never forget. Music was booming from the kitchen as her mother started preparing dinner. Stuffed capskins was on the menu. Nancy sat at the kitchen table and began fidgeting with her thumbs as small lines of sweat fell from her forehead. Mum, she spoke so little not even her black retriever dog could hear it. Mum, Nancy's mum jumped and nearly cut her finger as she was cutting an onion. For fuck's sake, girl, when did you get there? Nancy smiled, realising just how quiet she can be. She loved to scare her mum. So, mum, I want to join the Tuck and Jerry dance group. You promised when I was 10 years old I could join. Her mum places the knife gently on the kitchen top and walks slowly over to the kitchen table. Nancy, honey, I get you want to feel connected and all that. Mum, it's more than that. I was put on this earth for a reason. Uncle says it is my birthright to dance and walk with my people. Country is calling me. Nancy pleads with her mum. Nancy's mum knows what she must do. She made a promise to Nancy's father a long time ago. Okay, you can go. Stay with your Auntie Jessie in Murray Bridge. She will pick you up from the station. Keep your phone on you at all times. Nancy leaps with joy. She hugs her mum tight. Nancy is her only daughter. Nancy's mum wouldn't know what to do if anything happened to her. Nancy took a massive leap on the platform at Murray Bridge Station and looked around for her Auntie Jessie. Nancy takes off and runs into her auntie's arm. It's been too long, girl. They head to the car park and begin their journey home. Nancy saw a sign that said Raukin and some small kind of language underneath. The car drove into the area and stopped on a hill. Auntie Jessie got out of the car and Nancy followed her into a cemetery. As they walked up the hill in the cemetery, Nancy couldn't help but feel like a familiarity with the names. Auntie Jessie turned around and saw a confusion look on Nancy's face. Auntie Jessie, why are we here? Nancy asked. Jessie gestured Nancy to follow her until she stopped at a grave. Nancy caught up to her auntie. She looked at the tombstone they were both standing at. Nancy fell to her knees. It was her father's grave. Thank you. Thanks, Kimmy. This morning on our panel, we have Declan, Thomas, and Daniel Browning. Declan is a writer, poet, and essayist, a Yorta Yorta man born on Wongatha country in Kalgoorlie. In 2020, Declan was shortlisted for the Judith Wright Poetry Prize and awarded the 2021 Peter Beasley Fellowship for his Me Meandrian essay, Justice for Eliza Elijah, or a Spiritual Dialogue with Ziggy Ramo. His work has appeared in Australia, Book Review, Liminal, The Monthly, Overland, and, West, and The Westerly. Thomas Mayer is a Torres Strait Islander man born on Larrakia country. Thomas became a wharf labourer at the age of 17 until he became a union official for the Maritime Union of Australia in his early 30s. Thomas has been a ca campaigner for the Uluru Statement from the Heart using the skills that he gained as a union official and activist. Thomas is the author of Finding the Heart of the Nation. He edited and contributed to a collection titled Dear Son, and also authored two children's books, Finding Our Heart and Freedom Day. Thomas has also written for The Age, The Griffith Review, among others. Thomas this week appeared on Q&A and addressed issues regarding racism in the reporting of Aboriginal issues in the media. Daniel Browning is a Bundjalung and Kulalil man and is the host of RN's The, the Art Show. Since majoring in painting at university, Daniel has worked as a journalist, broadcaster, and sound artist. 
He has been working with the ABC since 1994, having worked across news and current affairs. Currently, Daniel is the editor of Indigenous Radio and produces and presents Away, the Indigenous cultural program on Radio National. Away surveys contemporary Indigenous cultural practice across the arts. Daniel is widely published as a freelance arts writer and has edited for ArtLink. For those who don't know me, my name is Marinda Dutton. I'm co-founder of Blackfella Book Club, a handle on Instagram with Taylor Reid, who's in the audience today. I'm a Goombangi and Barkindji woman and a lawyer by day. I think it probably goes without saying that having black voices in the media is important and valuable for many reasons. Black voices are talking back to settler colonial mythology as it pertains to us. In having black voices in the media, we are challenging the apparent objectivity offered by settlers. But more than that, we have always been engaged in the news. Long before there were televisions or radios, black fellows have always had a concept of news as a means of relaying knowledge and events of the day. We've done this since time immemorial. In the Gumbangi language, my native language, we have a concept called Nawa. It means many things depending on the concept on the context in which it is used, but it can mean things like a story, a yarn, speech, or the news. That we have been participating in news and media reflects the truth, that we have always been storytellers of the best kind. In reflecting on the question posed last night, what's changed and what's stayed the same, it's hard not to feel that not much has changed at all especially in the wake of the Zachary Rolfe not ver guilty verdict and some of the stories being published in the mainstream media. What's clear to me is that black fellows are innovative, generous and resourceful when it comes to storytelling. That in telling our stories we speak truth to and with each other. That in so telling we honour our ancestors and enact sovereignty. I'm hoping that over the next hour we can unpack these issues and ideas a bit more and interrogate some of the challenges that are inherent for us as black fellows in media. I'm hoping that um, each of you might be able to comment on what you see as the importance of black voices in the media. I'll start with you, Declan, and go down the line. <laughs> the importance of black voices in the media. Mm. I, you know, I, I have no easy answer to that question. I think... Um, I think because it's the only voice that makes sense in Australia, in the sense of if there were none, then Australia wouldn't exist. Um, you know, it would be this kind of Borgesian fictional continent um, premised on very little, you know, um, 200 plus years of set of colonial history. Um, and, and it, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned not much has changed. Um, speaking as a writer, I think in the literary sphere, so much has changed. Um, once upon a time, if you asked Australians what were their favourite books, um, they might say Tim Winton, Kate Grenville, um, and and you know we still could, but post Alexis Wright and post Kim Scott, just to nominate two voices who um, happen to have cut through. Um, and there has been, you know, since Magabala um, voices, but they haven't necessarily gone as mainstream, but they're very important. Um, you, I don't think you can as easily say just Tim Winton or Kate Grimble. Um, it's <clears throat> been a massive change in literature um, and it, changes that narrative um, that thinks a continent has to be written into history. The famous quote um, the Nobel Prize Committee made when Patrick White was awarded the Nobel Prize, and he's the only Australian um, author so far to have won the Nobel Prize, was that Patrick White had written a new continent into literature. Um, Patrick White is a very great author, but I think he was he would have had some sassy remarks to give about the idea that he'd written new content into literature. He knew he hadn't. Um, he provided a language post-war 
for Australian fiction that was um, his own and unique. But he knew he wasn't writing a new content to literature because all Australian authors know that there is no new continent to write. It's, um, you know, at the moment, it's... Uh, I'll use the word reckoning, although it's overused. A simpler way would even just to say a reflection of um, what language it is that we have um, given the attempt that has been um, ongoing to create something tabula rasa from scratch, um, to ignore all the languages on this continent, to ignore the cultures and histories, and saying, well, that seems illogical. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of ridiculous. I mean, why... It's, it's, a, it's, it's not... It makes no sense to start from a blank slate, um, both when it's not true as a matter of material fact, and um, and just for your own sanity, you wouldn't do that as someone who wants to um, build a nation, to feel a sense of community, to feel a sense of um, of personhood and identity in this continent. Um, so yeah, that for me is the uh, the importance of black voices. Is, you know, I wouldn't even use the word importance because it's more like the fact of black voices is the only meaning that um, the language at this point in time that we have on this continent can make sense um, uh, measured against is uh, black language and black thought. Um, and, and everything, I think, comes from that, including the great um, settler literatures of Patrick White or... Um, um, I've been reading even Beverly Farmer at the moment, but, you know, there are many authors and all of it has some knowledge sublimated or subconscious of um, the colonial status of this continent. Thomas? Yeah, thanks, um, Min. Uh, acknowledge country and pay my respects to elders past and present. I, um, I think um, if if our voices aren't there, then you know, uh, then someone else is writing about us, right? And I don't think anyone else should be uh, writing about us, but ourselves. You know, I mean, I'll give an example. It was a Courier Mail, you know, several months ago. There was some asshole journalist that basically said that. You know, while while we're marching on the streets about Black Lives Matter, that um, that uh, you know our children, you know we're we're being irresponsible, and our children are stealing cars and you know robbing houses, and and this is this is in the mainstream media today, right? Like now, sort of thing. And we had to respond to that, you know, like. If we're not in the media, if we're not writing, then that's the sort of narrative that's out there and that's what people think about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and it's absolutely wrong. And so we've got to be in the media and we've got to be taking to the pen, you know, and to the keyboard and, um, you know, to the stage and, and speaking for ourselves. I think that's the importance of us being in the media. And that's the truth-telling that we need to do, but... Um, but importantly, it's also about how we can move a nation to start to do better, and, and um, I think that's what the importance is. Yeah, I have to agree with, with both Declan and, and Tom in relation to this question of importance. I mean, I don't even think about it anymore. Mm. It's beyond question. Um, it's like essential. If the country's going to tell its story, uh, it needs people like us to tell that story, and not just us. I mean, the extraordinary thing with, with this term media uh, is that, you know, blackfellas are publishing on TikTok. Blackfellas are publishing on every platform that exists. Um, where I'm in a kind of very privileged position. You know, 27 years ago, I started working for the ABC, um, fresh out of university, and I was given a voice. But I always regarded that voice as being one that was mediated. I had no... It wasn't my voice. I was not, it's not me. I'm not there. I'm not present. I'm part of a conversation. The media is a mediator. We're in the middle. Media means in the middle. Um, it was never about the individual journalist. And I look to all the 
blackfellow journalist in the Brisbane ABC Radio newsroom in, in 1994 who nurtured me up, people like Charmaine Scott, Patrick Malone, um, Juro Sen, Francis Tapham, extraordinary individuals who did the hard yards, and not just those fellows. I mean, I was talking to you, Marinda, about this, talking about debts. We have debts. We owe so much to the people who came before us. We think, I, th I don't think, uh, I know who, who paved the way. I know who led, who, you know, we talk about pathfinders. You know, I found my path because someone else walked that path before me. I'm never the first person. I'm never the most important person in the conversation. Um, really important things that I teach other young black fellows as journalists. Do not put yourself in the conversation if you can help it. You know, we, uh, we express our subjectivity, our ideas about the world, in our words, in our stories. The stories that we tell are mediated. Someone else is telling those stories. I've got like an army of black fellows behind me, ancestors, telling me what to write telling me what I need to say. Just, it's really important. I don't even think about this question of, you know, what am I doing, why am I doing it? I'm doing it. Um, but I know that it's not my voice. I'm articulating something much deeper. Daniel, you touched on it a little bit, but, um, and you've spoken to me about this before, about the legacy that journalists are walking into. I was hoping you could share a little bit about that history and how, how much things have changed. Um, for black followers in the media? Well, they, ha they have and they haven't. Um, I think we were talking about this idea of change, you know, about... And I was... When I started working in 1994, I had very little I could do. I thought in increments. I thought, what can I do to change the story? What can I do to change the record? What can I do to change um, this question of representation? how we appeared in the media, what kind of, um, you know, discourses were we just always harking back to? What were the tropes and the lies that were being told about us? And I thought, I can do this in increments. I can do one story at a time. And subtly changing words, changing, you know, re-articulating re um, my positionality. You know, I know this story is wrong. What can I do to fix it? As a sub-editor, you know, preparing to do the Triple J News at, you know, five minutes to five, minutes to five in the afternoon, I know that word's wrong. I'm going to change that word. I'm going to fix that word because I know that I know the, the journalist doesn't mean that. Mm -hmm. That word has too many implications. Um, so, kind of re... Um, not rehashing, but remarketing stories for a youth audience um, put me in touch with how I needed to kind of rearticulate my own work. What are the things I need to free my own writing from? What are the legacies that I owe? And who are the people who taught me how to do this thing? There was a woman I used to work with, Charmaine Scott. She is uh, one of the daughters of um, 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 Auntie. Uh, Evelyn Scott, who sadly passed away. Um, Arnie Evelyn was, you know, for a time chair of the Reconciliation Council. Um, anyway, Sh Sharky, I knew Sharky, uh, Charmaine as Sharky. Uh, she just said to me, in, 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 in words when I was departing the Brisbane newsroom for the Triple J newsroom in Sydney uh, in 1995, she said, you go, brother, you go. And I have no doubt about those legacies. You know, talk, talk about the Flinders Island Chronicle, uh, middle of, you know, um, uh, the 19th century. Um, we have been writing uh, and asking and pleading and putting our case and positioning ourselves and expressing our subjectivity from the time we were able to, from the time the coloniser put their languages in our mouths. You know, we have been expressing ourselves and arguing our posi positionality. Um, Patrick Malone, a really important person in the ABC, uh, manager of Indigenous Broadcasting, helped set up the BRAX network, broadcasting into regional and remote communities. And the ABC was very much 
you know, helping uh, the Brax network get um, on air. Now, people like Patrick Malone, Charmaine Scott, um, you could go much deeper. Um, John Newfong, I'm thinking of John Newfong. Uh, and, you know, there was a, an extraordinary magazine in the, in the mid 70s called Identity. And it was an art magazine, it was a journal. It was blackfellas writing about themselves artfully. Um, we haven't, we're not doing this for the first time. I'm not doing this for the first time. I'm, I'm no one. I'm no one in this equation. Um, I just think we're always, we always have to think about where, where, what we're doing and whose legacy we must, we must acknowledge. It's never, it's never us. No, I always learn so much when I talk to you, Daniel, um, about the history of media, so thank you. Um, one follow-up question is, um, how can black fathers be using media to enact our communal aspirations? And I'm thinking in particular about the work you do with Away and Word Up around language. Um, do you have any particular examples of that? Oh, look, there, there are every, I think every time you sit down and write, aren't you, aren't you trying to use what you have if it's, if it's a voice, if it's a, you know, a 53-minute program on Radio National or a or a five-minute program on podcast, you're thinking about how can I... We can create communities with our words. That's what we do. That's what writers do. Writers create communities, whether we do it consciously or not. We create community, communities of listeners, um, of readers, and they don't have to all be blackfellas. But I think that where I cut through, where the content I make cuts through, is, is with other blackfellas. I, I, I have in my mind, I used, to, I used to always, you know, they say in radio, think of someone you know. Talk to someone you know. Have in your mind's eye a person that you, you love. And I used to always see my mum, then she passed away. Um, and now I just, I, I see a conglomeration of relations, you know. But sometimes I do see a white fella, because sometimes I think, you know, when, I'm over. I'm over educating. I'm over educating, but it's actually still a really important function. We are educating each other. We're educating other blackfellas. So I see a black, white, brindled kind of person now. I don't see my mum anymore, thankfully. Because I, sometimes I just think she'd be like, "Son, what are you doing? Uh, look at." <laughs> um, I don't. I don't. I don't hear you. But there's there's those times when I think, okay, well, I'm talking to someone else. I'm talking to another person who doesn't know Banjalung language, who doesn't know where Kalali Mob come from, who doesn't know what happened at Taru Mission, who doesn't know what happened uh, at Burnt Bridge, who doesn't know our stories. And do we want to just leave those fellas just out there? You know? I don't think so. I want to invite people into my world. I want them to understand what I'm seeing and hearing. It's a really important place, but it's not the primary um, function anymore. It used to be. It's not now. I think that's a good segue to you, Thomas. Um, you've campaigned for the Uluru Statement from the heart and you've really utilised the media to bring people along on that journey with you. Um, can you comment comment on what opportunities there are for us in utilising the media for advocacy and affecting social change? Yeah, well, I think firstly, just sort of running off Dan there uh, about, you know, the, the legacy stuff and the, um, you know, the work that precedes us and black followers coming together and putting, uh, you know, putting things together like that. I mean, there's a long history of statements and petitions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you follow that history of statements and petitions of these significant moments in our history where blackfellas have come together and, you know, done the hard work of debating and, you know, discussing and coming to consensus and, and, and trying to put words together that are going to uh, move people, you know, um, like from the 1930s, the, you know, William Cooper and the Day of Mourning and the Petition to the King, mm. Um, you know, the Akala Bark petition in 1963, 1972, the Larrakia petition to the Queen, um, 1988, the Barunga statement, you know, to, to a Prime Minister, to Bob Hawke, who went to Barunga and, uh, and was moved enough to make promises, you know, and 
And all that history of, uh, you know, that, that history of us coming together, uh, the history of these calling for a voice in each of these statements and petitions over and over again, and just building this movement over time. And then the Uluru Statement in 2017, which brings together all of the lessons of all of those broken promises and experiences, you know, I mean, I mean, how powerful is that, you know, that, that history of writing and black voices, you know, so um, it's, it's such an important thing and I encourage people to have a look at those statements and petitions and, and, and learn that history, you know, especially black fellas, because a lot of black fellas don't know that history mm. about our movement, the struggle, you know, the history of our struggle. Um, when the Uluru Statement came out, see, I'm a, I'm a union official, you know, I'm a campaigner. And, I mean, what a gift to, to us as a campaign. Uh, you know, firstly, it's a gift to the Australian people, right? It's an invitation. But in that, um, that uh, you know, calling it a gift, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for us. It's like campaign gold. You've got this eloquent and powerful set of words that just you just can't miss. You know, as in the, the way that it articulates our history, it hits the points of, you know, like if we're proportionately the most incarcerated people on the planet, then that's not because we're born criminal, you know, that, that my children wouldn't know the difference between right or wrong compared to other human beings. You know, that our children are still alien from our families doesn't mean that we don't love our children, you know, so it, it nails that. And then it puts very specific asks, you know, a very specific invitation to the Australian people to walk with us and to give us the constitutional right to be heard. And, um, and for the government then to dismiss that, you know, and for the Australian people to read what we're saying and, and to believe that this is such a generous offer, you know, it was, it's just um, a great opportunity for us uh, to, to continue that fight. Um, and then the, the artwork, you know, of the Uluru Statement, you know, the chukupa that's painted on, on that canvas uh, just really captures people's imaginations. It, you know, it, it catches the eye. It's something that sticks in people's memories. You know, it's such a beautiful um, object as well. And so my point is that's campaign gold, you know, as in that we can capture the, the heart of, of the nation. And... Um, and then when Turnbull so disrespectfully dismissed the Uluru Statement, I mean, the great, one of the great lessons from the past was that they would do that. You know, 1930s, never even made it to the King. It got to the Victorian Parliament and they dismissed it outright. Um, you know, the Yakala Bark petitions, um, you know, a parliamentary committee was established. They made recommendations for a voice, you know, a parliamentary, uh, you know, a, a, an ongoing dialogue between the Yolngu people and... And, and the parliament, and that was dismissed outright, and um, hunting grounds and sacred sites have been destroyed since. All of these petitions and statements have been ignored. Um, and so we had that uh, lesson that we had to put it to the Australian people. But on, on the question, when Turnbull so disrespectfully dismissed the Uluru Statement, we had nothing as in campaign resources. There was, it was just, people doing the best with what they could. I had the support of the union movement. Um, that gave me the opportunity to take that beautiful canvas around the country and start to inspire people. You know, Teela took on uh, Malcolm Turnbull on Q&A and, you know, that, that excited people and was like, yeah, Turnbull, you, you know, talking down to a black woman on national TV and, and Teela standing up to him. Um, you know, all these significant moments, Arnie Pat Anderson, you know, stoic, um, you know, resilient, uh, you know, doesn't take, uh, don't, doesn't take shit from anyone. <laughs> you know, we just didn't take no for an answer. And social media was so important uh, to us building this campaign because there was that little high, you know, like the, the Uluru Statement came out and we got some attention, you know, and then Turnbull dismissed it officially in October 2017, another little high, you know, but, but there's always silence in between. And uh, because, and, and even like our own mob, it's like, oh, you know, they've dismissed something again. That's, that's normal, right? That's what always happens. Um, so to, to really try to, to build this movement, social media was so important and just grassroots voices just saying, we're not taking no for an answer consistently for the last five years. 
And now 60% of Australians, uh, very close to 60% of Australians, are saying they'd vote yes in a referendum. Um, another bit of, you know, sort of consistent writing here, sorry if I'm rambling on too long, but, but report after report after report has said that we should enshrine a voice to parliament. You know, that a majority of Australians and a majority of black fellows want to do this. Um, and so that's also just been building it. The most recent was the Closing the Gap report, you know, not a lot of um, attention to it this year. Another failure, of course, as in Closing the Gap. Um, but, uh, but the first recommendation was that the Uluru Statement should be delivered in full and a, and a referendum should be held to enshrine a voice. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to get out there again and make sure that government's held accountable and they do that mm -hmm. and keep fighting. Thanks, Thomas. I think there's some really interesting links between that campaign and what um, Daniel was saying about us using, us becoming producers of our own media and using social media to get messaging out and um, information out, especially in communities where people don't necessarily have access to mainstream media. So it's really interesting. I wondered if you could comment on um, some of the things that have been coming up over the last week in the media in particular, and can you comment on the recent portrayals of Aboriginal people and your work with the Walpuri people? Yeah, I mean, I'm just another um, supporter of the Walpuri people. I haven't done a, a lot of work in that space as compared to uh, others. Um, but I think, uh, you know, all of us here and, and, and all blackfellas agree. I mean, it was just an injustice what happened. And especially when the media came out soon after Rolf uh, was acquitted uh, and just just sort of painting that picture again in the media, you know, that, that this was somehow... Uh, a young man that deserved what he got. Mm. And it's just absolutely disgusting. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've already rambled on a bit, but geez, it just, it just, it really grabs at my heart and just, you know, it makes me sad and it makes me angry and it, it really motivates me on, you know, the, the work that we're doing to see that the Walpuri people can, uh, will be listened to and that guns are laid down in those communities and to understand what they're saying is that you don't need guns in our communities if you actually listen to us, you know, and treat us like humans and, and give us that dignity. Um, that's, that's the main point, I think. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I just might, um, I, t can we get some tech support, actually? I just noticed that there's no, the clock isn't running for us. We're at 35 minutes. I'm not doing it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You've got 10 minutes before Q&A. OK, thank you. Uh, Declan, we might move on to you. You review, um, your, you review books for The Guardian, The Saturday Paper and Australian Book Review, among others. Can you give us a bit of an insight into your process and how you've carved out a space for yourself as a critic? Um, and the content that you review, because you don't necessarily just review black stories, do you? <coughs> no. <laughs> um, I also just want to quickly follow on, I mean, yeah, no, um, about Kumanjai Walker, but just because um, when I wrote the piece in Mianjin, um, Justice for Elijah, um, or a spiritual dialogue with Ziggy Rama um, dancing, you know, that was... A, after a lot of the commentary on Elijah Doherty had occurred. Um, but there was still a lot more to say, and there is still a lot more to say, and there won't stop being more to say. And I made a reference in that piece to um, an event that happened in the Northern Territory where um, some community, members of the community um, passed away. Um, in suspicious circumstances and that trauma remains there um, unless something is done uh, in that case ceremonially um, things were done to to move through that and I think the lesson or the reason I used that story was because um, as with Elijah as with Kumanjai Walker um, you know, I, I certainly haven't made any commentary um, in any form about what's happened. Of course, I agree with Thomas um, that there's something petty and gross about it all. Um, 
and I don't want to participate in that. I know when uh, George Floyd was murdered, the author Teju Cole said, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> um, because if you know, you know. And you, I think you, you make peace and you keep faith with the sense that there is a long durée, there's a long um, time that has to pass um, before anything resembling justice can occur. Not because there isn't passion and fight, but because, um, well, because there is so much injustice and the only way to make sense of that and to honour that on some level is, um, yeah, to take care of yourself and to um, take care of others and just, um, well, yeah, I mean, that does tie into, I guess, um, the day-to-day -day work of reviewing. Um, the sense is that there is a lot to be said and I liked Daniel's idea about accretion and invitation. Um, and again, when I wrote the Elijah piece in Mianjana, uh, I added a lot of voices and it's the work of authors to see what is beneath the surface of things. It's a second life. When I'm reviewing or when I'm writing myself, I'm looking for a, a second life. Um, I actually took a break from writing before I started publishing where I felt that everything was so two-dimensional. There was no... I, I'd taken away my own second life, which I had in writing, because all that writing does is it channels what's there. It's, you know, in this moment and in every moment, there is something very, very meaningful on, you know, an emotional, a philosophical, um, an intellectual, a physical level. Um, and that's what we find in, in great writing. Um, and, and when a story is communicated that resonates, it's that that's speaking to you. And I had that sense when I, before I started publishing, I'd given up writing a thing, I wouldn't be a writer. Um, that, you know, having a shower or driving a car was suddenly this, this shockingly grim activity because what was the point? Um, you know, on an existential level. Um, and for everyone, you know, we find that second life in something, and for me it's in writing, and that's what I try to do. I, you know, when I review things, um, you mentioned reviewing, um, you know, a range of books. Uh, I certainly lobby for, for many genres, and I, I, I don't want to essentialise identity as I don't want to say, you know... Um, the nature of the country we live in is so rich with languages and cultures, and I'm not interested, to be honest, in 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 attrition, in taking away. Uh, and again, that's why when Daniel mentioned invitation, I found that really interesting because as an author, Juan Goy de Solo, um, he was a great author, and he talked about it's always better to add than to subtract. Um, and growing up in Kalgoorlie, I mean. <laughs> And, and uh, yeah, I grew up monolingual, uh, and later on I learned other languages, uh, I gradually realised how true it was that the act of accretion and the act of addition was so enlarging, um, enlarging. And, and, you know, I have the privilege of literacy. I can read and write. I'm living in a country in a very privileged position within that country. Um, I feel that it would be ethically wrong on some level for me not to um, to do the things that I'm doing in terms of reading and writing where I, I, I don't try to communicate to any particular sort of imagined audience. I don't say, well, I'm writing for the Sydney Morning Herald. I'm going to... The quote is dumb it down. I apologise for that, you know, kind of language. But, I mean, that's the feeling. They... Uh, I, I, did, I, haven't, I don't have any artistic um, sort of background in my family. Um, and I'm most often self-educated. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, my mum says I should use less large words in the work that I do. Um, but it's funny because, you know, I use large words that I happen to, to read, you know, I, that I... 
notwithstanding the circumstances of a person's life, and you know, I'm lucky that I was able to have the time and space to do that reading, it is available. And I don't believe that, I don't think in my head, well, this audience is a bit stupid. I better, you know, give them a sex and shopping novel because that's what they like to read. Mm. I think that that's kind of middle class gatekeeping. Mm. I think it's anti intellectual. And I think, you know, as someone who doesn't come from a background of intellectual pretensions at all, that <laughs> I actually do find it very, um, yeah, that it's gatekeeping to presume what your audience does or does not want to know or to read and what they are or are not interested in. My only presumption is that when I was growing up and I read widely, that I wanted to know everything. I wanted to always be adding. And I want, you know, I write for the writer and the reader. I don't write for publishers or editors um, because I do think, you know, we say that we have a very small um, literary scene in Australia, uh, which is not literally correct because the population's fairly big, the literacy rate is fairly high, um, and it's, you know, a privileged continent um, for most people. Um, and within that context of what's well, not a small scene, it's a self-regarding scene. It's a scene where we're too concerned with the Q&As and the editors and the publishers and infighting. Mm -hmm. and, but I just think of, you know, having grown up as someone who wanted to believe what they read, wanted to be taken seriously as a reader, um, and doesn't, yeah, doesn't want to, uh, um, wants that seriousness in the writing. Uh, so that's, that's how I write, is for the, for the author who I think has taken the time to write a book um, and it's a very serious part of their life, it's a second life. And for the reader who also I think can be really changed by what's, what they read. Um, I take that seriously but I'm not sure, I think when we become self-regarding and navel-gazing, um, we move away from that into something more like the Devil Wears Prada kind of gossipy. Um, yeah, as much as I love Stanley Tucci, I'm trying to avoid that. I also think we need to think in very large terms about what the media is, what, what stories we're telling, where we're telling those stories. Mm. You know, TikTok is a great publisher. Mm. Um, what I see blackfellas do on TikTok is storytelling. Mm. You know, we, we don't have to have a large... We don't have to sell, sell, you know... We don't have to win the Stella Prize or... Um, any other award, what, what Blackfellas are doing already with this extraordinary uptake of new platforms, new media platforms, um, is proving this incredible storytelling bent that we have and nurturing that. And seeing that is like really encouraging. I talked about incremental change, about sitting at a sub-editor's desk in 1999 and changing a word here and there. I thought in increments, is to think in one word. At the word level, I was changing things. I no longer believe that. I did, I did what I did, what I had to do, um, what I felt compelled to do as a black fella, as a truth teller. Um, but now you don't have to do that anymore because the landscape has shifted so remarkably in the last 15, five, 15 years in terms of the literary landscape. Um, and in terms of our media literacy and our engagement with media. Um, and you see the best stories on TikTok. <laughs> like, there's extraordinary storytelling. Mm. And it's simple. And it's engaging. Funny. Um, it's funny. It's, it comes from the heart. Um, that's where I think, you know, a lot of the future is. It's not actually in what I do. It's not in sitting in, in a booth, in a studio, you know, thinking about every word and intoning. <laughs> Now, next. <laughs> Ooh, like, I'm so important. Um, but, you know, at the word level too, every single word we utter is important. And I think of like oral literatures. Our languages are oral literatures. We've been telling, our, we, we position ourselves with our languages. Look at one word um, in, in Bunjalang. And I've used this word in several times on this very stage to talk about how our languages are full of meaning and subjectivity. And these are things that we are ha we've been handed. And we either take them or we don't. We regard them or we don't. In one word in Banjalang, the word baragir. Baragir. 
These two things, Barai, high, up, God, the, the, the essence of, of life. Um, Barai Gir, you know, it, means the, it can mean the um, uppermost branch of a tree. It's also the youngest child in a family. Your Barai Gir is my... My Burajam is my Barai Gir. My, my nephew is my Barai Gir. We refer to him as the, the last bit, the last branch on that tree in this generation. And so that tells you what, how important languages were. Our languages told a story about our relationship to country, our relationship to trees, and a sense of responsibility for, over, over generations. You know, like, sometimes I think, we don't have to write anything. It's already written. The story's already written. We are articulating a story that's already here, you know? The story's written itself. And in relation to what happened in the Northern Territory, you know, I worked uh, as executive producer on a podcast called Thin Black Line about the death in 1993 of Daniel York. And, you know, what we tried to do with that podcast over six episodes was to communicate, you know, obviously the particular circumstances of that young man's death. But by slowly unpicking what happened, trying to present the anatomy of a death in custody. What happens? What are the mis what, what's miscommunicated? What are the things that are missed? What are the stories that we aren't hearing? What happens in a watch house? What happens in the back of a paddy wagon? And, you know, the, the one thing I couldn't come at is, you know, we, we actually spoke to the one person who could give us an account of what happened to Daniel in, in the hour between when he was picked up, um, um, just not far from Musgrave Park, um, in the, in a, you know, on a very hot spring day in 1993. Um, actually, a hot summer's day in 1993. Um, we spoke to the one person who could tell us what happened to him. And then, you know, not, as we prepared to publish that story, a six-part podcast, um, that young man himself passed away. He wasn't a young man anymore. He was actually in his, in his 30s, in his late 30s. But that whole, I think four or five people died in, 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 the, in, the, in the unfolding of that story. Um, even a very senior activist who I can't name. Um, and I was just like, this is every single story. This is every single death in custody. It has this complexity. It has this depth of story. It has this many lives. It has this many personalities. Daniel's, Daniel's, one of Daniel's brothers is the poet Lionel Fogarty. Lionel Fogarty has, is, he's one of these voices, he's one of the voices that we have to acknowledge. Mm. He's been telling his story poetically for a very long time, but he talks about the power of young Daniel um, and what he communicated when he danced and the energy. And I think that every single, I hear about Kumanjai, Kumanjai Walker, and I think of Daniel. And I think in exploring those stories, in, um, in doing what we do, unpacking them, we're to actually telling, a sto we're telling the story today, it doesn't change. And that's what I hope with the, with the podcast that we would communicate, that it, it, this, you may want to call this a historical death in custody. There's no such thing. Mm. They are endlessly repeated. The afterlives, if I can just say of that, yeah, very true, what Daniel's saying. Um, Lionel Fogarty has a collection coming out in June, actually. Um, and uh, I borrowed one of his poems to write something and made reference to um, Kev Carmody's song, The Dancer Is Dead. And yeah, the, uh, and to hear Dan say, I'm speaking of this today, right now, um, and the that it's already, things are already there, there's lives that are continue and we have to go on speaking. Uh, so I, I'm so happy to even think I'm living in a time where Lionel Fogarty, you know, will have a new, totally new collection of poems coming out. Um, and I'm talking 
I'm thinking about that all the time. And, I, and Dan, you know, long before I would have been thinking of it, was involved. It's incredible we're on this stage, yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got eight minutes to go. Um, Daniel, I was hoping... You, um, so you, you, you touched on it a little bit for, before, and I was hoping maybe you could all speak to this, is about what does black um, voices in the media look like in the future and even in just black media itself? Um, oh, look, it's, it's, uh, it's mind-boggling. Like, I just, I'm so excited be, because, you know, I, you know, we talk about media literacy, right? Mm -hmm. But literacy is really important. And knowing, one of the things that really heart, I was heartened by in the, in the, in, in the wake of the um, decision made in the Northern Territory was the way the family um, dealt with the media, mm. the way they held the space mm. and absolutely owned, owned their moment and took their moment and articulated a, the kind of deep, you know, that their pain, but articulated it. You know, it's hard to articulate grief. It's hard to articulate pain. Mm. It's hard to articulate the sense, a sense of the, in, the, in, the injustice of it all. It's hard to articulate those very big emotions at such a crucial time. I mean, things could have gone two ways, really. You know, there were two outcomes, really, when you look at it. Mm. But the family, you know, to their credit, held their space and made everyone listen. And I think without exception, you know, we might talk about how the media treated, you know, those stories and treated and, and dealt with that articulation of grief, but they, they got to express it. And that gave me so much heart, and I know it was a heartbreaking outcome for the family, but there was something in it, there was something extraordinary in, in that articulation of grief. And I, I think that's a really, that's just one angle, one, one, one side of that story. I need, to, I need to pay that, I need to acknowledge that. But I think in terms of the future, it's, 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 un, it's unlimited what we can do. It's unlimited what black fathers will do. It doesn't, it's nothing to do with me or Tom or Declan or even you. Nothing to do with this microphone, nothing to do with the ABC, nothing to do with any publisher or broadcaster. This is what people will, ha will make happen for themselves. They will represent themselves. Mm. Nothing to do with us. Thomas, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think, um, I think firstly, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's many more First Nations writers, you know, there's, there's, there's so many that are emerging and, and, and doing their thing. And uh, I think that's... That's partly us, you know, like um, you know, holding our space and, and taking our place, uh, our rightful place to be heard. But I think um, it's also this great hunger that um, Australians have to learn now. I think um, I think a majority of Australians know the truth of what's happened in this history, and they want to learn more. Um, that's not just you know, I'm just uh, making that up. I mean, like polling and and you know, research shows that people know. Um, want reconciliation, for example, you know, want to change the constitution and recognise us. So, so um, and that, that then causes publishers to want to publish more of our work, you know, so there's, I think that that's going to snowball and, and, and this is a wonderful, wonderful thing um, for us to affect change. And I think the other thing is that, um, you know, I really admire, uh, you know, the work that many of our people are doing and just breaking the rules, you know, or making up their own rules and, you know, not conforming, mm. uh, you know, I mean, the great poets like, um, you know, uh, you know, Jazz Money and, uh, yeah, Curly and they're just really doing some great stuff and um, want to see more of it. Yeah, deadly. Declan, do you have any comments in relation uh. to literary <laughs> criticism? Uh, I'm conscious just, uh, thank you so much for for coming at such an early hour um, and we might have time for questions. But I, all I would say is, um, you know, the future to me is um, to always be adding um, and to recognise what is in front of you. Um, and I think the ongoing struggle that um, 
maybe everyone in Australia has, is the reality of their existence being seen in the sense of, you, I think many people maybe um, walk down Swanston Street and it doesn't matter if they're confronted by Chinese signs, it wouldn't matter what language it was in, there's that tunnel vision where people only see a simplified version of a community and people stick with their own. Um, but what pre-exists us and what exists right now is such a, a multiplicity of communities. And so, you know, I think of Alexis Wright, you know, she has Chinese background, but it's never associated with, um, well, why not? I mean, I think it's beautiful. I think that, you know, um, First Nations identities have these multiplicities of connections um, that should be such a big, that to me, that is cosmopolitanism, you know, it's, it's not something fancy, it's something ordinary. It's actually the nature of our existence on this planet is cosmopolitan, um, in all of its formations. And I think in Australia, um, we're too inclined to ignore all of the privilege and the, the things that are already here and to just only see a, a dun-coloured um, monochrome landscape of maybe one culture or one language that really makes no sense here in, in most parts of the globe, but especially here. Thanks. Can I just say one thing, though, Marinda, before we, before, yeah. we, before we go? And what I, what I want to talk about is, just very briefly, is this idea that we have to hold to the truth, that we have to tell true stories. Well, I think what we'll, what we'll in part, of this, part of this exciting new landscape is, you know, works of the imagination, works that aren't tethered mm. to injustice and suffering mm. and hurt and mm. pain and trauma. You know, when we, when we are really allowed, as human beings, us blackfellas, to imagine mm a world that we don't inhabit, you know? That's what I look forward to when, when we are completely untrammeled in that respect. We're not hindered by our past or the, the trauma, you know? You know, I think the flight, of, the flight that we will be capable, capable of in these works of the imagination, I think, is what, is what really kind of gets me up in the morning. It's like when we are allowed to, what will we imagine? What kind of future will we imagine? I think I just got goosebumps, Daniel. I'm excited by Indigenous futurisms and I think um, the, the future is exciting if you think about it like that. So thank you and thank you to our panel this morning. Um, thank you, Declan, Thomas and Daniel. That was really beautiful. <laughs> I think we've gone a little bit over time this morning. Well, 44 <laughs> seconds, 43 seconds. Do we still yes. have time for a question or two? <laughs> I think we still have time for a question or two. If anyone has any questions. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, no, there's a question. Oh, I think this extraordinary, like, this is what I was talking about, you know, we need to pay, pay respect, we need, to pay, we need to pay our debts in terms of who we owe, legacies, uh, the legacies, we must acknowledge them. Nima, I mean, we're talking about Frida Glynn, Imparja TV, um, Tiba, all the Bush broadcasters, you know, those Bush networks are, uh, you know, communities have been telling their stories for as long as we've had access to satellites, but even before that, an extraordinary, these are, these are literatures. I mean, we talk about like this, you know, the book, mm -hmm. but we've written books. You know, I don't know how many books I've written. Um, I, don't know how many, I don't know how many books I've facilitated, you know, in, in, in enabling and facilitating the voices of others. There's just so much to kind of pay forward. There's so many debts that we owe. And in terms of public broadcasting, uh, broadcasting in general, I think, I think there's so much history there that hasn't been told. I want someone to kind of stand up and say, well, the, the history of Aboriginal radio, absolutely extraordinary, absolutely amazing. So I'm nothing, I'm, I'm no one, I'm just, I'm not even, I'm not even on the, 
in the landscape in terms of that history. It's it's remarkable. Yeah, my thoughts on you know like this that that time and that uh, you know that surge of of black media uh, goes to the political. You know in you know, what was happening in the country at the time as in support for this type of, uh, you know, these these types of things that happen, you know, for because it takes resources, right, to mm. do all of this. Not much, though. To, to, to yeah. But the AVC, you know, um, you know, that is being defunded, uh, you know, terribly by the, the coalition government. I mean, this is this is about taking away these voices, you know, and, and, and holding us back. And I think there should be more support, more resources for this. And um, you know, and so it really does matter what happens in politics. I yeah. think. Oh, you know? absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, that's but that's just one articulation of kind of politics. Mm. You know, we think about um, Radio Redfern. Um, obviously, we, we, it's hard hard to kind of articulate that now. But people have been doing it for so long, and not just in the seventies. Um, prior to that, you know, we've had Bush broadcasters do it, telling their stories for such a long time. I want this history of Aboriginal radio because it's, it's as important as a book. It's as important as the books I'm reading today. Um, yeah, that's what I'll leave it there. Time's up. Yeah, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everybody.